In our last video, we explored the astonishing discovery recently made upon the Giza Plateau. Hidden in plain sight, another great sphinx. However, this doppelganger of the better-known, long-claimed sole guardian of the Great Pyramids seemingly possesses a greater level of undiluted erosion, indicative of both sculptures' tremendous age. The questions are, however, just how great is their age? How long have the Sphinx, or indeed the Great Pyramids, been here on our planet? Furthermore, the tremendous levels of erosion seen on the pyramids themselves. Not only do the pyramids display a level of erosion, indicative of a prehistoric timeline, but they have seen many additional efforts by a number of now lost civilizations, each far more capable in regards to stonework than the modern man, created a number of layers of far less eroded casing stones, each displaying a varying age this evidence indicative of several attempts at conservation. These factors all but support the following posit, made by a number of researchers, all claiming that the Sphinx, and indeed we feel, the pyramids themselves, are in actuality as much as 800,000 years old. The most recent studies were surprisingly presented at the International Conference of Geoarchaeology and Archaeomineralogy held in Sofia. Titled Geological Aspect of the Problem of Dating the Great Egyptian Sphinx Construction. The authors of this paper, mainstream scientist Monica Vacheslav from the Institute of Environmental Geochemistry of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, and Alexander G. Parkamenko, Institute of Geography of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, have blown the whistle regarding what we have supported for a number of years. The starting point of these two experts is the paradigm shift, which has been initiated within the, quote, debate, which has been intended to overcome the orthodoxy within Egyptology, referring to the possible remote origins of the Egyptian civilization, and, on the other, physical evidence of water erosion present at the monuments of the Giza Plateau which, although suspiciously mainstream researchers such as West and Scotch have made over the years, specifically titles the water erosion controversy, which deliberately overlooked that the Sphinx, having once been recorded as having been surrounded by a body of water, namely Anubis Lake, meaning that the enclosure was once designed with the intent of holding water, itself in turn concealing the Sphinx's possible true identity. Instead, focuses on the erosion clearly made by rainfall and ancient water levels, features we indeed claim were later additions. According to Manichev and Parkomenko, quote, The problem of dating the Great Pyramid Sphinx construction is still valid, despite the long-term history of its research. Geological approaches and other scientific methods permits us to answer the question about the relative age of the Sphinx. The conducted visual investigation of the Sphinx allowed the conclusion regarding the important role of water from large bodies which partially flooded the monument, with the formation of wave-cut hollows on its vertical walls. The morphology of these formations has an analogy with similar such hollows, formed by the sea in the coastal zones. Genetic resemblance of the compared erosion forms and the geological structure and petrographic composition of sedimentary rock complexes leads to the conclusion of the existence of long-lived freshwater lakes within various periods of the lower Pleistocene era. These lakes were distributed in the territories adjacent to the Nile. The absolute mark of the upper large erosion hollow of the Sphinx corresponds to the level of water surface which took place in this early Pleistocene age." End quote. A link to the research can be found in the script. It is a vindicating exposure of ours and others' work, one which we find highly compelling. Kent Weeks is an Egyptologist, a Connecticut-based archaeologist who studies the culture and artifacts of ancient Egyptian civilization. He's a man who owns a comfortable home in a wooded part of Old Lyme. Yet one senses this is but a stopping place to hang his hat, since long ago, Kent Weeks hung his heart in Egypt. Originally from Seattle, a lifelong love affair with the mysteries of Egypt was ignited within Weeks from an early age. 
he recalls that he never cared about anything else. Reading about Egypt and archaeology was all Weeks was interested in doing from the age of seven. My parents didn't think it was dumb and my teachers encouraged it. I never outgrew it, says Weeks in one of his books regarding his incredible discovery within the Valley of Kings. After pursuing qualifications in the field, Dr. Weeks became aware of the need for a dependable and comprehensive mapping of the tombs and other numerous monuments in the Theban region. Weeks decided to create a project to survey and map the Theban West Bank and thus the Theban Mapping Project was created. In 1987, while following up clues from ancient texts, the reports of earlier explorers and the results of remote sensing surveys, the project examined an area to the northeast of the entrance to the tomb of Ramses IX, where he felt a long-neglected tomb might be located. Located a mere 70 meters from King Tut's initial resting place and totaling an incredible 121 chambers with connecting passageways, it is the largest and quite possibly oldest tomb ever discovered in Egypt. An immense underground system which lay forgotten for thousands of years. It has also been an incredibly expensive tomb to excavate. Considerable architectural supports have been required because of damage to the tombs, although we suspect this is due to the tunnel's immense age may be far older than we are led to believe. Additionally, several tons of very ancient flood debris from past flash flood events from Earth's very distant history has also required removal. Just how old are the tunnels Kent Weeks found in the Valley of Kings? The Great Sphinx displays similar scars from past submersion from seawater. Some conclude these ancient monuments may even predate the last ice age. Unfortunately, it had been looted on several occasions, leaving little in the way of precious artifacts strewn amongst the debris from the past deluge. The remains of numerous mummies, which have been discovered during archaeological works, are just a drop in the ocean regarding the treasures once buried in the chambers thousands of years ago. Finding such items within millennia of junk can be a painstaking and time-consuming task, something which continues to this day. In the spring of 1995, a team of Egyptologists entered a T-shaped extension of the tomb which goes to the east. The researchers were overwhelmed with the magnificence of the tomb. Although it was badly damaged, it remains a beautiful example of what we believe is original Egyptian art, the true constructors of the pyramid. The rock-cut image of the god Osiris still located in the tomb, protecting the burial chamber's occupants. Although mainstream archaeology, including Weeks, states the preservation of the human remains was very poor. We propose these mummies to be several thousands of years older than claimed. We believe this discovery to be an incredibly important and incredibly ancient one, proving that there was once indeed a great flood, a premise now held by countless individuals who have studied the facts of our history. As always, thanks for watching guys, take care. Rising nearly 400 feet above the desert floor, in a remote section of New Mexico within ancient Anasazi territory, is a place named Chaco Canyon, and within stands an imposing natural structure called Fajada Butte. Hidden from the world for over 700 years, along a precarious narrow ledge, there lay a secret, ancient, astronomical observatory. Subsequently given the name Sun Dagger, and the reason why is nothing less than remarkable, it has been revealed that for more than a thousand years, the Sun Dagger has been revealing to all aware of its creation the subtle changing of the seasons. In 1977, it was thankfully rediscovered when rock art and petroglyphs were spotted nearby. Anna Sofer, who was cataloging the rock art, was one morning greeted by the Sun Dagger, slowly traveling across the wall, traversing the strange spiral patterns which were etched upon them. The intelligent Anna realized that the Sun Dagger could have been connected to the petroglyphs, so along with her colleagues, she came back at various dates throughout the year, eventually establishing the following information. On the summer solstice, the Sun Dagger appears near the top of the largest spiral, and over a period of 18 minutes it slices through the very center, cutting the spiral in half before leaving it in shadow for another year. On the winter solstice, two daggers of light appear lasting for 49 minutes, during which they frame the large spiral. Finally, an equally fascinating and more complex light show occurs on the spring and autumn equinoxes. 
The large spiral is carved in such a way that counting from the center outward to the right, there are nine grooves. On each equinox, a dagger of light appears that cuts through the spiral on different angles. Meanwhile, a second dagger slices through the center of the smaller spiral. These light shows, which had been going on for centuries, continued for several years after their rediscovery. However, in 1989, it was found that the granite slabs had shifted. The alignments that had been arranged so carefully were no more. It also seems impossible for us modern people to realign them as all attempts have failed. Was this sun dagger really made by the Anasazi Indians? Or was it a far older surviving relic, one that they were merely aware of? A relic which has unfortunately eroded away? Similar ancient light displays marking the solstices and equinoxes can be found at other locations as well, such as in the southwestern United States and Mexico. In a ruin in Hovenweep National Monument, near the borders of Utah and Colorado, light beams also illuminate spiral petroglyphs on the summer solstice. At Burrow Flats in Southern California, a winter solstice sun points a finger of light to the center of five concentric rings in an early Chumash rock art display. Were these monuments once used by a lost, ancient advanced group of marauders as calendar sites while traveling America? Perhaps one day we will know for sure. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. New Caledonia, a French territory in the South Pacific, comprising dozens of islands. It is best known for its palm lined beaches and life rich lagoon, which at 24,000 square kilometers is among the world's largest. Yet what many who investigate and visit the islands are unaware of is the enigmatic mystery of the tumulus. Found particularly upon the Isle of Pines, with over 400 of the structures found upon this one small island. Once argued as merely natural formations via volcanic activity, this hypothesis, however, has since been disproven, and their artificial origins have been confirmed. Yet, this is not the most peculiar fact to surface surrounding these mounds. Intriguingly, it is a very little, if at all, photograph set of artifacts. A series of small, man-made cement cylinders, each measuring around 40 to 100 inches in height and between 40 and 75 inches in diameter. They are the oldest cement artifacts officially discovered anywhere on Earth. Made from a very hard, homogeneous lime mortar, containing bits of seashell which garnered carbon dates of around 10,000 BC, putting their earliest official creation at around 3,000 years, before man was even supposed to have reached the Pacific from Indonesia. It is no surprise, then, that many now try to claim that the cylinders never existed, and instead, a mistake was made in regard to the actual basis of the tumuli, which have since been also revealed to have once been created using ancient concrete. However, this claim of convolution does not explain how we have many independent references to the cylinders found in a number of books and other articles of media dating to and just after their initial discovery. Also, the measurement of scale, which is clearly far too small to be attributed to the measuring of the mound's inner chambers. Furthermore, due to the controversy and impossibility to explain them using the already established chronology in regard to the migration of man, we have motive for many individuals to simply disappear the artifacts and in their place, create a conspiracy to attempt to discredit their existence in the first place. Were these concrete cylinders buried in the tumuli for some reason? We still do not truly understand the function of these mounds. Yet could they have protected these artifacts for untold millennia? Perhaps also from a great flood? We find such possibilities highly compelling. There are countless ancient ruins found throughout Sri Lanka, which are all indicative of a lost technology, and thus a lost civilization having once been responsible for their creation. One of the most striking of these being the Sigiriya Mountain, an ancient stronghold made atop natural plateau, a sanctuary far away from the troubles that would have presumably been occurring below. 
Yet one of the most astonishing relics found within this ancient land is a rather well-hidden one. Although the water reservoir built into the Siguria site could offer one a subtle initial clue as to their existence, one would have to investigate the surrounding environment very carefully or be given local knowledge to ever find our next ancient anomaly in question. Hidden close by to the ancient mountainous stronghold, and now almost completely submerged into the surrounding landscape, gargantuan ancient water reservoirs, first documented by a Mr. Tennant from the UK and noted upon by William R. Corliss within one of his many volumes regarding lost civilization. Describing enormous water tanks found with the aid of the locals, all completely aligned with equally cut square blocks. One of the tanks, which the locals knew by the name Petheriacorn, has since been measured to be around 7 miles in length, 300 feet broad, with 60-foot-high earthworks along its biggest embankments. They are largely believed to have been constructed to gain complete control and subsequent mastery of irrigation throughout an impressive span of land. We approached an expert engineer to find out just what sort of feet these giant tanks would be. We received back an estimated price of around $4 million to merely construct the largest sections of the earthworks. They were undoubtedly an unimaginably large undertaking, one which we believe was beyond the capabilities of any ancient group known to modern history. Perhaps the sheer enormity of the undertaking, along with the fact that they would have been far easier to conceal than that of the Great Pyramids, for example, is a possible motive as to why there isn't more known about these marvelous groundworks, or why there is very little documented study, and why any that has been done was by independent historians. Regardless, we find these incredible, gigantic, hidden ruins highly compelling.